I'm Tom Hardy and you're watching the Venom vlog. One man here. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Venom Vlog. This is episode 350. And for our celebration, what I'm going to do here is record uh, an audio commentary for the entire Venom movie. So I'm going to actually sit here and watch it. You won't be able to see or hear the movie at all because uh, obviously we want to avoid copyright claims and all that stuff. And I don't want to give away the movie to people who haven't seen it. Uh, but I know a lot of you out there who watch the show obviously already have seen it. And this is going to be me talking about it and uh, sharing my thoughts. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start the movie here, and uh, when I say play, if you're watching at home, feel free to hit play at the same time. So if you want to go set that up, you know, feel free to, and uh, you can, however you want to adjust the audio, you can have my video playing and have the TV audio low, however you want to do it, uh, but this way you can kind of hear my commentary track. Some of you have been asking about this for a while now, and I've been trying to find time to record it, and I just haven't, and today I figured, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to record the whole thing. Hopefully my phone can handle like a two hour video recording. We'll do our best if there's jump cuts in there, you know, I'll do my best to edit everything together and stuff. So, uh, you know, yeah. And then throughout this episode, we're also going to give away 31 digital comic book codes. Uh, it is the 31th, uh, 31st anniversary of Venom. Uh, you know, last year in May was his 30th anniversary, and we celebrated that by giving away 30 digital codes. Well, I have 31 new codes to give away since it's his 31st birthday, and we're going to do that throughout this movie. So as we're watching this, the codes will pop up on screen at random, and the first person to put those codes in at the Marvel website gets the codes. And there's the website you're going to be going to, so there you go. That way you can have it all set up and ready if you want. And then as we go through this movie, feel free to take a couple codes if you want. One, if, you, if you're not feeling too greedy, grab one and save some for the others. Uh, but whatever codes you get, whether you get one or all of them or some of them, whatever it is, let me know down in the comments below. All right, so without further ado, let's do this. I'm going to hit play movie right now and play movie. The Sony logo is coming up. Um, so we're, we're going in now. From here on out is the movie. And a lot of people, you know, I, this movie has a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, even from me, you guys saw my review, I believe I gave it a 7 out of 10, uh, which means I didn't love the movie as much as I wanted to, but I certainly didn't think it was as nearly as bad as everyone claimed it was. And, uh, and there are a lot of people out there that hate this movie just because it's not an MCU movie, um, which that is... I, I, that kind of mentality just irritating to me. I can understand being a passionate fan for MCU. I am a fan of the MCU, uh, but I am not so blind of a fan that anything outside of it, it can't be good or can't be given a chance. And uh, some people will say, hey, I gave this movie a chance. It sucked. And I don't know. I, I gave this movie a chance and I, I like what I saw. I, I, the movie to me is just fine. It's a good movie. It's a, it's a step above meh for me. And, uh, and so, so I had fun watching it. And I think I saw it what, four or five times in a movie theater? Uh, this opening scene here, actually, there was originally a scene conceived. I don't know if they... They didn't film it, I don't believe. But originally there was going to be an opening here uh, in space with the rocket... Or not the... Yeah, like a rocket coming into view. And then it landing on the meteor where the symbiotes are. Because the symbiotes are basically um, hitchhiking on the back of a meteor. And, and it's, you know... The plan is it to bring them down to, uh, you know, Earth... Uh, in some way. So, uh, so yeah, that was the original plan, was this ship here the, from the Life Foundation was, uh, we were going to see an opening where they, where John Jameson, uh, J. Jonah Jameson's son, actually lands on the meteor and finds the symbiotes. Um, kind of like, uh, I guess the, the way they probably had it in mind was, uh, what was that movie? Was it The Rock? No, not that The Rock. Uh, uh, the other one. The, the one with the meteors coming and Liv Tyler's in it. Uh, that's another Jerry Bruckheimer, uh, uh, Michael Bay movie. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't remember. I can't blank it on the name of it right now. But Ben Affleck's in it and uh, and uh, uh, blanking on everyone's name. <laughs> this, uh, ben Affleck's in it. Yeah, I'm just going to look at Armageddon. That's it, Armageddon. <laughs> and Bruce Willis is in it. Um, so yeah, so we're going to get a little here in the opening scene we're seeing the ship crashed. I remember when we were watching the trailers for this and all of us were theorizing of you know what's you know we we obviously knew it was the the a shuttle crashing and symbiotes were on it we were everyone pretty much guessed that but there was a lot that we were speculating and stuff and it's fun to watch this movie after all the speculation too cuz there were so many things we all got wrong um and then there were so many things we yeah you know, some things we got right so uh Dora Skirth here uh made up character for the film 
there's Shope Aluka. She um she was in Black Panther, but she pops up a couple times in this movie. Um and then we have Jenny Slate there, beautiful Jenny Slate, um playing uh Dora Skirth, who's like I said, new character created for the movie. But I like this. There was a good casting on their part because uh, she's you know comedic actress and it's neat to see comedic actors do things outside of the things they're known for. Um, Michelle Lee here. We all thought she was going to play uh, uh, Di uh, Donna Diego from the comic book Scream, uh, but uh, we were wrong about that. Uh, she was listed as Donna Diego in the uh, IMDb page at one point, but then they changed it to, uh, to MT Worker or whatever. That's John Jameson. So uh, you can see his name tag there, and uh, they even say his name, like uh, Jameson's Alive. So where he was, I don't know if he survives this <laughs> ambulance crash here or not, uh, but he was alive at least. Well, yeah, look at that. Oh, and here we get our first reveal of Riot. Um, and obviously in the previous scene, we saw Carlton Drake uh, uh, played by Riz Ahmed. Um, and he's going to set up, we're basically getting our introduction to the antagonist of the movie. We got Riz Ahmed, and then now we have uh, Riot here. And you can see instantly, visually, they're setting up a lot of visual storytelling. That's what I, I love when movies do that. So right here, you see that it can heal, like the suit has the ability, whether it chooses to or not, but it can heal. Um and you set up, like, you got to look at this from a point of view of someone who's never heard of Venom before or seen Venom before. And if they're watching this movie, the information they're getting there, whether they pick up on it or not, is, all right, this thing can heal you, uh, whatever this that creature was, and it can look like people. So already they're getting a ton of information that they have to try to remember uh, for later on. Because when Eddie gets these abilities, you're like, oh, it's the same thing from the beginning, you know? It's a, um Um, we got Michelle, the beautiful, beautiful Michelle Williams here. Very talented. I'm so, I was really excited when she got cast because this is just not the type of genre and movies that she typically does. She does a lot of indie films and, and um, dramatic films, and she's really great in them ever since her days of Dawson Creek. And, um, and she's done a lot of really great stuff, played a lot of great characters. And so when she was coming in for this, I will agree the wig doesn't do a lot for me. Um, and the thing is, is like, they're like, I don't know what the the, the 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 thinking was on that. Like, because Anne doesn't exactly look like this in the comics either. So it's weird for them to go like, oh, uh, we're, we did her hair like this to make her look like Anne from the comics. But they didn't. I think they made her hair look like that to fit the kind of the decade that they're trying to make this movie in. They try to set it like in a late 90s, early 2000s kind of comic book movie. So they wanted her hair to kind of reflect those times, I guess. So it was all intentional, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I know you got to think about everything when you make a movie, but I don't know if I would have went that route or, or if I liked that route too much. Um, but then you get to see the relationship there. You see Eddie's kind of happy. He's with a, a, a beautiful woman. He's enjoying his life. Um, and then you see his career is kind of taken off. He's kind of got this man on the street type of reporting. Um, and he talks about, look at this, like it covers everything he can. Um, and it, it shows a side of Eddie that he was at least a hardworking journalist. Uh, they want to, the thing that gets him in trouble in this movie is actually trying to tell the truth. Whereas in the comic books, he, he fails at telling the truth. Uh, although, but he thinks he is. Again, the comics, he's, He's investigating a story called the about the Sin Eater, and it's a serial killer that's going around killing cops and other people in the comics. And a kill, uh, Sin Eater kills a woman named Jean DeWolf. Uh, she's a police officer that gets killed. Um, and, and so Venom in the comics, or Eddie Brock, is like, he thinks he's talking to the actual Sin Eater. And without checking his facts, without looking into it, he just keeps going. So he, you know, there was probably a voice in his head saying, hey, this isn't professional we should probably find out more about this guy. But then there's another part of him that's like, no, but look at what we're getting. We're getting recognition. We're getting fame. We're getting accepted. Um, and that's what Eddie Brock's always wanted throughout his life. He wants his father to accept him, his sister to accept him, um, people to accept him. And he he does shady things sometimes to get that acceptance. And that's what's interesting to me about the character is that he very much lives in the gray, almost more than most or any of all superheroes uh, or antiheroes out there. Like he definitely lives in the gray. 
Um, but you see here, Eddie's like trying to do the right thing. And his boss here is not, he's like, look, you did something in New York where you, where you dug like this and it screwed you over and it almost ruined your career. So don't do it again. Like, you know, like I can't give you this chance because if I give you rope on this story, you're going to hang yourself with it and you might hang us and our reputation. So I can't do it. So that's the kind of the set, the crux of that, that scene we just passed there. Um, but it's great because this, this early stuff is all about setting up relationships. It's, uh, this movie, relationships, is very much the theme of this movie. Friendships, relationships, love interests, uh, uh, symbiotic relationships. That's the theme. And it, more than just having that as a theme, it, it asks questions about those themes. What is a friendship? What is our love relationship? How can we make it better? How, how, does it, how are we making it worse? You know, um, having a theme is one thing. But, you know, just saying, oh, love is a theme, that's not strong enough. You have to question love what is love define love for your characters that is how you write theme in a storyline and this movie does relationships very well um better than i thought it was gonna actually uh although in some areas it's kind of weak too but you know you don't want to i guess like overstimulate an audience with too much information you want to try to strike a balance and i feel like this movie tried to it tried to strike a, a balance with a crowd that probably wouldn't appreciate that balance too much um, but at the same time, I mean, this movie made $850 million on a $100 million budget. So clearly people accepted the trailers enough and accept the look of it enough to go see it and, and watch it. And the ratings of the, um, you know, the viewers was definitely way higher than the, the ratings of, uh, of the critics for sure. And then here, everything's going pretty well for Eddie. I mean, except for the fact that he wants to stand... His moral ground and he wants to go after Carlton Drake and, and expose him for the person he thinks he is but he still needs evidence on it uh, but he still his gut is telling him uh, and here he has an opportunity to actually look into that um, and uh, and he sees that she's getting you know emails on her computer about Life Foundation and that's obviously Carlton Drake related so it puts him in a position right here is the moral this is the crossroads that every hero or villain in their story hits which way am I going to go? The good route or the bad route? Um, but then you see here that he's taking the bad route. He's he's invading his girlfriend's privacy and looking at information from the Life Foundation because she's working a case for them. She's hired. She's in a. She works for Michelini and McFarland. You can see right there the law offices of Michelini and McFarland, which is obviously a reference to David Michelini and Todd McFarland, who are the two creators of, of Venom. Um, and later on, we'll see, uh, I think they said something about the Schuler building, like like uh, when Eddie moves into his apartment, he lives in the Schuler building. And that is a reference to Randy Schuler, who is the fan that actually drew a picture of the black costumes, black Spider-Man costume, sent it to Marvel. They said, hey, we'll buy this off you for $220 and we'll feature it in an upcoming issue. They did, and they never gave him credit. They were just like, hey, we, here you got your 220 bucks. The idea is ours now. And uh, and we're we're even, but no one over the years ever gave that guy any recognition. Uh, he was he was he kept himself hidden for a while, but a cut like maybe ten years ago or so, he came out and said, "Hey, I'm the guy who made the the worst deal of a lifetime, and I sold the black costume idea to Marvel for two hundred twenty bucks." So I guess as a tribute to him, they named one of the buildings the Schuler Building after him, Randy Schuler. So I thought that was cool because I think that's the first time he's ever gotten recognition in any way for. For the creation of black costume and he didn't create the alien or the story behind it he just created he just did a drawing of the look of black costume spider-man um yes oh yes this is our scene um uh, adrian adriana uh the girl who's in this scene here she's like the the producer of this segment for eddie right back there um she actually did an intro to one of our shows. You guys probably seen her before. Um, she was really nice. I reached out to her on Instagram and she said, oh, I would love to do this. That's so nice of you because we actually got Jared Bankins to do one who he'll be coming up later uh, and Martin Batch Bradford. So uh, it was nice. Uh, and Ellen Gernstein uh, also. So it was great to have all these people who played these, uh, these smaller parts. We were able to shine a little bit of a spotlight on them on our show, even though our show doesn't have big reach. It was, it felt good to like, you know, you know, pay, like thank them for their 
efforts and being in the movie um and then also getting them you know putting their names in a lot of your heads out there because a lot of you guys probably would ignore these background characters when you're watching a movie and i didn't want to i want everyone who was part of venom i wanted to celebrate uh everyone who was part of this movie because uh, i was so happy that this movie was being made that i wanted everyone to get some kind of spotlight on them in some way even if it was a small spotlight for me but i wanted it to happen um, so it was nice to, to see her in this scene here. She's, she's really beautiful. Um, but I love this scene here, the, the dynamic between two, these two were like, you know, 15 minutes into the movie and, uh, not even 15 minutes, we're like 10 minutes in and we got the villain and the hero clashing with each other. Hmm. Riz Ahmed does really good in these earlier scenes as someone who's trying to be likable and, and is trying to pass, you know, the, the accusations off um, charismatically. But uh, later on when he's like supposed to be the bad guy, I, I didn't really buy him so much. Like when he's like angry and yelling and stuff, he's a good actor, but he wasn't selling the Carlton Drake uh, character to me as the movie progresses. In the beginning here, I liked him. Um, but later on, not so much. But here I like this. They talk about journalism. Journalism is the thing that I think is pretty much dead nowadays. There are some good journalists out there. Um, but uh, even some of the YouTube ones who say like, oh, I'm just here to like get to the truth and, and share with you, whatever. Even they like a lot suck at what they do. Um, this this thing with journalism now and today is it's so easy to, to get wrong and screw up. And I think that's what makes Eddie so relatable. Eddie is actually trying to be a good journalist um but in doing so he's burning every bridge in his life uh, including his relationship with the love of his life uh, and um and look at that it looked like they were engaged like they were uh, gonna get married uh or maybe she was married to him i can't remember um but they're definitely done now. <laughs> they're definitely done now because his actions have consequences. And that information he had only could come from her, even though he didn't give up his source, um, which he could have, and he could have kept his job. Uh, but that, you know, that he knew he was like, oh, that, this could mean involving Annie, and I don't want to do that. But he ended up doing it anyway. She found out because Carlton Drake, you know, pulled strings, you know, found out where that information was sent to, how people could have got it, and then it led him to you know, Michelini and uh, McFarlane, the law offices of. Here we got the three symbiotes. We got a yellow symbiote, which in the comics is Scream. A yellow and red symbiote uh, is Scream. So we don't know if that's actually who that is in this movie because we never see the yellow symbiote bond to anyone other than a rabbit, I think. Uh, then there's the blue symbiote, who, um, I, I mean, I, I would have guessed it would have been like Riot because in the comics, Riot was, I think, more bluish. So it's hard to say who the blue one is, because um, I think Lasher's green and Phage was like, I don't know, purple or something. Um, but then you have Venom, like there's the third symbiote there. So, And what I found interesting too was that it just went with the name Venom, like, like that's its name. And I don't know if I completely like that or not. I'm not so sure. Um, I liked that he became Venom because... He was like, all right, like in the car car cartoon, the animated 90s cartoon for Spider-Man was the best, where he goes, from now on, Spider-Man, we're going to be poison to you. That's why we call ourselves Venom. And that would have been cool if there was something like that in this, where he was like, Carlton Drake, you know, or like, or someone says something to, to Eddie about like, everything you touch is like, you, you poison or something. That would have been fun for him to like, wear that on his sleeve. Like, you know what? I do screw everything up. And so for that, when I become a monster, I'll call, we'll call ourselves Venom. But um, again, they keep it things simple for, for more of a mass audience. Uh, here you're seeing Riot's powers. This is Michelle Lee. She's an amazing stunt woman. She's been in a, a lot of done a lot of great stuff. If you follow her Instagram account, uh, she'll show you know she posts a lot of great stuff. Um, I am curious about the decisions here. You can see that it's trying to learn to talk. Um, again, these are visual story cues, not things that they're going to sit and explain to an audience. But it's, you can see that it's trying to use language. So she's like, I, 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 like trying to talk. But this whole thing of moving from a younger, more vital host to an old woman. And then the old woman still six months later is still alive. When, when they show the symbiotes like eat their hosts. 
like here, you're going to see that they're looking for a compatible host for each of these symbiotes. So it's I'm curious to see that 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 older Asian lady was compatible with Riot somehow, um, whereas like a young person like Michelle Lee wouldn't have been. So I don't know. So there's some things in this movie that I'm like, I don't know if I get the logic. I guess you can't decide who your ultimate host is. Maybe she was a good enough host for a, a while. But yeah, when you see her towards the end and she jumps from an old lady then into a little girl, you're kind of like, it kept picking girl hosts too. So I kind of expected it at the end to be part of, like to bond with another woman. Um, I think instead of Riot, they should have done Scream. Um, I think Scream going around picking all these women hosts would have been cooler, like Michelle Lee, and she could have turned into Scream. Uh, maybe they didn't do that because they were thinking of Carnage. Like, oh, we're going to have a red symbiote in the next movie, probably, if we get a next movie. So we sh we shouldn't do yellow and red, maybe. Maybe that was their thought process. But to me, I, I would have it would have been cooler if they did Scream, and then they maybe could explain Scream as, like, as the leader of this group. Maybe she's like, hey... Because the, the kind of the backstory here with the symbiotes is that they're looking for planets to inhabit, obviously. Like, they're, they're looking to conquer and, and spread and then, and then build a ship to go back and get the rest of their species and come back. Kind of like in Planet of the Symbiotes comic book where they're building, like, a Stargate to bring all their, um, you know, family members and all the other Clintars to Earth. Uh, here's Jack the Bartender, uh, played by Mac uh, Grant. Uh, Jack the Bartender, we theorize that maybe was a cosmic character from the Eternals comic, but it turns out not so much. So, so I guess we were wrong on that one. Yeah, so anyway, um, the, uh, the, the Scream character, I just, like, the backstory was, it's supposed to be that the symbiotes are looking for things to conquer, and that Venom itself is kind of a screw-up like eddie brock that's why he ends up liking eddie brock he says i'm a lot like you on my planet i'm a loser and uh you know the, the backstory or the things they talked about in interviews and stuff was that these these symbiotes riot was a team leader and he had a team and basically venom was put on his team and he's like i don't want venom venom sucks he's like a he's not a good he's not gonna be good for this mission and they're just like they're like look you know we're conquering a bunch of planets you gotta send venom with you and uh and he like you know venom comes along but, uh, but Venom is like the underdog. He's like the little guy, the runt of the group. Um, and, uh, and then, so, so throughout the whole story, he's supposed to be the underdog. I get it. And then Riot's like the big, you know, muscular, you know, thing you got to fight. But to me, I'm still like, I don't know. I, 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 maybe I would have rather Scream been that part. Because at least Scream to me is more recognizable and more noticeable than Riot. And more fans at least know who Scream is than Riot. Um, what the mass audiences are blank slate it doesn't matter who they are uh like they they don't know who these characters are they're like i don't know riot and scream or phage like wouldn't matter whoever used for them so it's probably why they went with riot for the movie they just wanted that but riot looks so much like venom like i like contrast so he's like this dark gray color and he just doesn't work so that's that's my only issue with riot i kind of wish it was scream i think that would have been way cooler uh in the scene before this we saw melora walters uh melora walters was someone that we kind of guessed was in this movie because we saw in the stunt credits that there was someone playing they were like doing stunts for melora walters and it was this uh lady named ice i think her last name is ice or something and she's like a stunt woman and it was like uh, she was doing this she was listed as doing a stunt for melora walters and i'm a more melora, melora walters fan so i was excited she was in this movie but we were just going off that so we made a video on it. it turned out to be true so when i saw her in the movie i got so excited i was like yay it's melora walters and she's playing a homeless woman which is like a connection to the lethal protector comic where eddie brock looks out for the homeless and that's kind of what he was doing with that carlton drake story but when it blew up in his face now he doesn't know what to do so he's he's at least nice to her he's like you know what i'm going to be nice to this lady um and I, I love this. I love that line so much. She, you know, she gets robbed right in front of Eddie and Eddie does nothing. You know, he can't, he feels, he feels like every time he takes a stand, he loses. And so he's defeated and he, he doesn't want to take a stand anymore. That's kind of Eddie's arc in this, in a way. Um, and so when that lady gets, you know, robbed right in front of him, he's kind of like, whatever. I, I, you know, um, I'm, you know, and then he looks at her kind of like, I'm sorry, I couldn't help, but she understands. She's like, look, life hurts. That's, I love that line. She's life hurts, Eddie. It, it just does. Um, and I think right there, there's a connection of like, they both know 
that they're both in pain in some way. She has this horrible thing where guys are muscling in on her business and taking her money. And Eddie can't seem to keep a plant alive. And the guy across the hall, Scott Decker, I think he's a, a cast member in Walking Dead. Um, this is great because there's some Easter eggs in here. Uh, is it Barry Bushkin? One of the text messages that come up says Bushkin. Right here, Barney Bushkin. Uh, sorry, Eddie, don't have anything here. That's uh, his boss at the Daily Globe in New York. So in the comics, that's who he worked for, uh, Barry Bushkin. Um, and then he got fired because uh, he screwed up the Sin Eater story. So they allude that he screwed up a story in New York. We don't know what's the Sin Eater story, but they allude to it. For me, like when I was, when we first, you know, before the trailers came out for this movie, before the casting came out, um, and before we knew Carlton Drake was in it and Life Foundation were in it, we, I was theorizing that the movie was going to be Eddie Brock versus the Sin Eater. And I was really excited about that. I was like, that's really cool to set that up in the first movie because I didn't want symbiote versus evil symbiote. And it turns out that's what they did because that's what every comic book movie does. And it's a little frustrating. Um, you can see Scott Decker here, though, playing his guitar really loud and Eddie just not having it. This happens to me a lot when I'm trying to record videos. There's always noise going on during the daytime. And that's the only time I have now to record stuff, which sucks because I used to record stuff at night when it was nice and quiet in my previous apartments and the previous place I lived. But here I, I can't. It's like it's like so I got to record during the day and I everyone's making noise during the day. It sucks so bad. So if you hear noise, if you hear helicopters, you hear cars, guitars, whatever you hear outside, you know, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> I'm doing my best um, right now. I can only hear the movie. I can't I can barely even hear myself talk. Uh, this is Jared Bankins, the uh, the amazing Jared Bankins, uh, who I hope one day if I get to write a movie, uh, I hope I can talk someone into casting him. I love his performance in this scene, the way he um, conveys his pain, his sadness, his confusion. Um, he does such a great job here. Um, even selling that window as being a one-way mirror, because um, it's, uh, it's, it's not like he's looking through, but he, like, he can't see. Um, yeah, but yeah, I like this too, the biblical touch to it, because Eddie Brock, obviously in the comics, has, he's Catholic, he's, you know, he went to church uh, to ask God for forgiveness, because he was about to kill himself, and that's when the symbiote showed up on him, and uh, and turned him into venom. Um, they also mentioned cancer in this, Eddie Brock does uh, later on get cancer in the comic books, and they try to retcon it to where they said he's always had cancer, and that's why he went to church, because he knew it was going to kill him. And so he was taking the easy way out, I guess. He didn't want to, like, battle cancer. I don't know if I am fully on board with that or anything, but that is a theme with, with uh, Eddie Brock and Venom. Even in the Ultimate comics, uh, Peter Parker's dad and Eddie Brock's dad, uh, Eddie Brock Jr.'s dad, they were trying to discover a cure for cancer, and they were using the black symbiote that they created to do so. Uh, so again, the, the Life Foundation here started out as a group looking to cure cancer and other ailments, so they kept that thread in there. Uh, but this biblical point of view that Carlton Drake has is interesting, considering he's an explorer, you know. Um, I think that's actually neat characteristics for that character. But here you have the blue symbiote, and like, yeah, look at Jared's, you know, there's nothing in the room, and Jared really sells this. Um, I especially love the look coming up where where the suit is kind of like right in his face. And you th yeah, that's when you think it's going to go in his mouth, like a typical alien movie, uh, you know, where something's going to be like, go into his system that way. But nope, it just blends into the suit and goes in through his pores. And, <laughs> and this ready, ready. I love this shot here. He's like, whoa, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And then it's just, he just, like his head's turning. Yeah. Look at this. Like the way he moves his arm. Look at that. That movement is, it's so great. And I don't know how much of that was Jared and how much of that is enhanced. Cause I know the, they enhance some of it, the look of it with uh, CG and stuff, but some of his movements like this here on the ground where he's just like twitching and then stops cold in the middle of a twitch. Really well done. Really well done. And then sitting still back there while this is happening, pretty well done. So, yeah, I know I like Jared a lot. He was on the show, uh, The Purge TV show. And uh, when he told me that, I was like, I got I to gotta watch the show. I got I to gotta buy every episode. So I bought the entire season and watched the entire season. Um, yeah, so, yeah, 
Great stuff. And then we have here, we have Eddie Brock coming back to the place where he last saw Melora Walters. He's walking down the street. Um, and then he notices her missing. I love that little kind of, some people took it as flirtatious. I think it's just Eddie being Eddie, like old Eddie, like trying to be kind of charming and convincing. Um, but Eddie's really sad and broken at this point, but he notices her missing. And, uh, and so you, you take note of that, you know, wouldn't be a Sony movie, movie without product placement. So there's a lot, um, And I like this because you just think he's being crazy and talking to himself. Because um, outside he turns, he's like, you don't see what he's looking at. But he's like, I'm being followed. And then boom, he reveals he is being followed. <laughs> hmm. He just hands her the can of peaches. <laughs> It's funny, too, because they shot this movie in Atlanta and San Francisco. And, uh, I mean, as someone who's been to both cities numerous times, even I am, like, it's very clear, like, where it's, like, they, they did it really well. Because some scenes, I'm like, all right, it's just a street, and it's whatever. It could be San Francisco, whatever. But then there are other times when you see the, the hills, you're like, okay, that's definitely San Francisco. Although there are some, you know, some hill areas in Atlanta, too, but... It's, it's just funny. I think all of his apartment interiors were shot in Atlanta, but exterior of his apartment and Anne's apartment uh, are not. They're obviously San Francisco. Um, yeah, I like this. Yeah, I like this here because you, Eddie, you need that scene where Eddie's like, I have to, he has to explain to somebody why he doesn't do things. Like if, for people who aren't getting that he's on a downslope in his life. Um, I mean, they get it, but they're like, they, they still need to sometimes clarify exactly why. So you just give him one little monologue scene where he's just like, here's why my life sucks. And, and here's why I'm not getting involved. And here's the reason why I'm going to stand on the sidelines and let you sink along with everybody else, because I don't give a crap. Um, this comes across a little, <laughs> a little stalkery ish kind of where he's, um, you know, walking by her apartment and then gets busted. Um, but I again, I think that's beyond that level of stalkery that it can, you know, kind of come across as. I think it comes across a little less stalkery because you understand now, especially after that monologue, that Eddie Brock is at the bottom. And when you're at the bottom, you try to look for the people who, who kept you at the top when you were at the top. You look for those people, uh, whether it's ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-whatever, family member. You uh, you look for that connection because you're like, I'm so far down here and I don't know how I got here. So I need to see the person that I used to be with up here or people that I used to be with up here. Um, I also like that too, a little bit like that the guy's likable. Um, they kind of do that in Ant-Man as well. Uh, which is also set in San Francisco. So it must be something in the water there about guys. Uh, they, maybe they're a little bit more laid back when ex-boyfriends come around uh, or ex-husbands come around. But um, I don't know. Reed Scott's a likable guy. So, um, you know, I guess it's pretty cliche a lot to where he has a, she has a new boyfriend and he, you know, he hates Eddie Brock. I guess it's pretty standard to happen in a lot of movies. But um, I don't even know if I would have given her a boyfriend. I don't know. Um I mean, it's good to see that she moved on. You you, you want to show that, you know, to an extent of, of the character because you don't get a lot of screen time with her. And I've heard Michelle talk about this character and, and kind of dissecting the character, and she's so smart about it. She she really tried to figure out who Anne Wang is, uh, which is saying a lot because I feel like a lot of the writers who wrote her in the comics never tried to figure out who Anne Wang is um, at all. And so uh, it's it's... You know, this is just great stuff. I think she first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man 374 or 375, which is also the same issue, I think, that um, Venom said in the comics. Uh, lungs, brains, pancreas, so so many snacks, so little time. Like, all that comes from, I think, the same issues. But they were Amazing Spider-Man issues where Spider-Man fought Venom, and Venom kidnapped Peter Parker's parents, trying to save them from Peter Parker. Uh, so, yeah, really good stuff. I, I, I love all that stuff. And, and you know... Um, she probably had the most personality in that book and then the and maybe in the book where she was you know leading up to her death where you know she's 
wore the symbiote and started to go a little mad from it, um, especially after killing some guys. It, it kind of tore her apart emotionally. So uh, I could see that. Um, you know, like, like that's probably the most we ever got out of Anne in the comics, and we didn't get a lot of Anne in the comics. So it's having Michelle play her and put a voice to her and approach her a certain way is, is really nice because now I feel like I kind of get a sense of who Anne might have been in the comics based off her performance in the movie. And here you could almost argue that maybe Eddie went up here to kill himself, but then look, coincidentally looking up and seeing Life Foundation there in the side of the mountain, which, I, by the way, that's a great location. I wish they showed more of that because you get this great shot of it like that here, but uh, because of budget, like they, they couldn't show it like blowing up from the outside or the symbiote jumping all over it. They, you know, like they, they kind of kept the, the, the scope of it down towards the end, which is a shame because it looks like an amazing facility to run around and get into some fights in. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks really great. But, uh, but yes, I feel like she gave a really good stamp on Anne Wang. So, uh, you know, when you when you hear her in interviews talk about Anne and she talks about her relationship with Eddie and stuff, it's important that the character moved on, especially to her, because she's like, yeah, I, the, the the difference between Eddie and Anne is that Eddie, they both, Eddie and Anne both hit a low. She got fired and he got fired, but she bounced back and she she found a new guy to be with. She found a new relationship. She found someone who makes her happy and then she found maybe a new job. She moved up where Eddie kept moving down and that was important for for the characters, and I agree to that, but they don't do a lot with Reed in this movie uh, to make me wish he was here, too. So, like, I get that he's there, and it's like, okay, he's got to be there because he's got to run the tests on Eddie, and he's got to, you know, see that the symbiote is live and blah, blah, blah. But you still could have got that from Doris Girth, like, you, if she just didn't die. If you if you didn't kill her, she could have been the one who gave Eddie more answers, too. Um, so it's like, I don't know. I probably would have rather had more Doris, Doris Girth in the movie and, and less, uh, and less uh, whatever Reed Scott's character's name is. I keep forgetting it right now. But uh, but I like Reed Scott, so this isn't like a blow at him. He does a good job as the character. Um, but I, I liked Dora a lot. I wanted to see more of Dora. I mean, she's just like she's really cute, and she's also like I, I, her character intrigues me. She because you know she has like a husband and, and kids at home, and she's you know she's worried that she's now one of the bad guys. She thought she was on the good side, and she's she has a crisis of uh, consciousness. You know, she's like uh, I, I can't keep going down this road anymore. You know, this movie again not only does it do really well with relationships and the theme of that, but also choices and the choices we make. I think that's another great theme in this movie. Um, we, I remember seeing this in the trailers and a lot of us were like going crazy, like, oh, he's going to get the suit down here. How is he going to get the suit? Carlton Drake is going to like, uh, kidnap him or like hold him here. And then he's going to, and put the suit in him or something. Like there were so many theories out there about what was happening. Um, but here you could see there's the, uh, I don't know. I think that was the blue symbiote. No, the blue symbiote's in him. Um, what was in that last room was like someone who got killed by a symbiote. And then here you have her still alive, and this is Sim 1, I think they called it, uh, which is Venom. And see, the thing is, th these are the tests they're doing. Like, you see one room, it was, like, really hot looking in there. And then another room, it was, like, the two other rooms were really cold. And it looks like this was their test. They were like, all right, if we, ing if we put the suit in a human, um, we're going to have to, like, amp up the temperature because the heat hurts them. Um, as we've seen in like tests or whatever. So, so again, more visual storytelling uh, without explaining it. Uh, it's there for people who want to read into it, and it's and, and for people who don't, you know, they miss out on it. Um, but it's like them going, okay, we got the host in her, but we don't want it to eat her alive and kill her like and twist her around like it did to uh, Jared Benkett's character Isaac. So we're gonna put her in a room where it's cold. Um, and uh, and just to test out the you know that's another part of the test phase. I like that. I mean, it's it's the the impact of Eddie hitting the guy is not shot well. Um, I'm gonna guess because of you know I don't know budget or whatever time on the day. But I did like that shot where he like jumps on the wall and pushed himself off. I wish he would have. I wish it would have been a wide shot of him hitting the guy and ramming the guy into a brick wall and causing craters around. You know, it's 
just to show that power, to demonstrate that power better. Because that shot, you see his feet move, and then you see him fall to the ground with the guy, and you're like, what just ha what happened? It's it's too quick and not really well done. I like that these guys got Jeeps. These are, <laughs> because it's just like, well, why not, I guess. That's awesome. Like some of these, like where he's getting, he's, he's not moving on his own. You can tell it's not him moving. Um, I like that they edited moments of that in here. But this is definitely Atlanta. Like there's, I, I, I'm i pretty sure this is not shot in San Francisco. Um, these woods and the kind of like that location when they're running out of the base and stuff. I'm like, I don't think these locations are in San Francisco. I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess not. I'm going to guess these woods aren't, uh, some of the woods are, you know, probably added CG and added mist to it uh, and post. But um, for the most part, I think those woods are in uh, in Atlanta, I'm going to guess. Like outside of Atlanta somewhere. <laughs> I like this too because he immediately calls Dora Skirt, check to make sure she's okay. Because he got busted and he wants to make sure she's his source is not hurt. So again, there's still there's a lot of good in Eddie. He, he, he I would I would say there's a part of him that's very considerate uh, and selfless, but it's just hard work getting there sometimes. I also like this too. The alien being is now in him, and he has to try to figure out what it wants. Um, he's hungry. He's so hungry now, and it's because of the suit. The suit was in a freezing, you know, environment. Um, and I saw some people like commenting about this, about like, uh, you know, the, the tater tots and stuff. Um, and, oh, you know, Venom doesn't eat tater tots. It's not craving tater tots. It's like, yeah, it's not craving tater tots here either. That's just what Eddie Brock has <laughs> in his fridge. He goes and eats this chicken. It doesn't crave the chicken either. It makes him throw it all up. Um, yeah, there's a chemical, fesothletamine or something like that, fesocetamine, that's in chocolate. I think it's in lobster as well. Um, and it's in, it's a, something the human body produces, the brain produces, um, that the symbiote feeds off of. So when the symbiote says, I want to eat brains, it's not cause it's like a, like a zombie monster that is like for the violence of it. It's because it, it knows human brains pump that chemical. Uh, and then that chemical can also be found in chocolate and lobster, which, uh, is a real thing. Actually, it's a re real thing. You can look it up. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, you know, oh yeah, sorry. I, I, the dialogue got a little loud there for me to keep talking. Um, but yeah, so that chemicals is, is a real thing and it's in chocolates and lobsters and, uh, and you can eat it, you know, and, uh, and that's what the symbiote, so once the symbiote realizes oh, there's other things I can eat other than just human brains, it, it goes for it. Unless it's in a battle with Eddie and it's like, Hey, look, I'm hungry right now. Maybe we could eat a brain or two of these bad guys. Um, so yeah. And then here's, we got, uh. I'm, bl I'm blanking on the villain's name, not Trask, because that's X-Men, but, um, but yeah, who, the guy who plays him, like, he, he's also kind of forgettable in this movie. I like his, he's a good actor, Scott Hayes, he's a good actor, but uh, the character he plays, uh, is it Roland Treese? Uh, first of all, it's a different version of Roland Treese than the comic books. It, it feels like a name just slapped on. Like I said, Sony does this sometimes with Resident Evil and Spider-Man Homecoming, where they just say, oh, that character is this name from the comics. And they just do it for that reason, and that's it. They don't do it for, they don't care, really, about anything. Um, so they just, like, I oh, just slap a name on the character, whatever. It's for fan service. And it's like, yeah, but come on, how many Roland Trees fans are there out there? So who cares? And again, like I said, six months later, we're seeing the old lady again, and she's, like, starting to wither away. Um, and it's looking for another host now. But it's, like, really the symbiote, like, Riot stayed in her? for for six months and then now it just sees this little girl wandering by herself with no parent you assume she's with yeah that lady there sure um maybe i don't know but then <laughs> i don't know whatever there's something in this movie that i just i can't like i can't defend at all this is great so this is to me where the movie the eating scene just a minute ago and now this with the voice starts coming in this to me is where the movie gets really fun because this is tom hardy completely completely um dedicating himself to this role which is something i just never would have thought uh, i'd say like i know toe for grace he did uh, he did an okay job on that version of venom but i would hardly say he 
dedicated himself to that character. And maybe it's because the character, the movie wasn't about him, really. But Tom Hardy here really dedicates himself to Eddie Brock. Um, and so did Michelle Williams with Anne Wang. But look at how he, like, it's it's comes across comedic, sure, it's chaotic. Comes across a little werewolf in London, or American werewolf in London, fly a little bit, um, where there's like a, a comedy to it. Um aspect to it but it i don't know it works for me because it, it's like because it's it's funny but in like a in, it's scary to them you know it's funny to us because we kind of know what's happening we can kind of guess what's happening but to read scott and and uh, michelle williams and this these patrons here they're like what is happening and eddie's like look but he breaks that guy's nose he's he's eating heads off lobsters he dives into a lobster tank um this is freaking them out i know our reaction is laughter either because it seems stupid or silly to us or because it actually genuinely makes some of us laugh like humorously, like it's funny. But to everyone else in that restaurant, they played it like, oh crap, we're scared. And then having Reed Scott even defend him, he's just like, you know, he's doing it out of love for Anne, but also he admits, hey, I'm a fan of yours. I've watched your show, uh, Eddie Brock, and, and uh, I, I loved it. And the stuff you revealed and exposed, like, you you know, you did really good work out there. So he's kind of an admirer of Eddie's. Um, there is, I think there's cut footage from that scene there. Because he goes, hey, Eddie. They cut it there because it's a better transition into the hospital scene, I think. But there's there was a lot more in that sequence. I think some of it appeared online somewhere. But they there was a lot more. Oh, Dan, that's his name. Um, but there's a lot more to that scene. Like, they, there's a lot more running around, a lot more trying to calm Eddie down. But I think a lot of that was ad-libbed in, on the day because I know there's a, a ton of stuff. I think they said there was 40 minutes of cut footage that Tom Hardy said he wished was in some way in the movie. But a lot of that is just like the the commitment to the role. It's like him dancing. Remember when we saw that scene where he danced and stuff, um, you know, uh, outside the, the car and, and going into the, the, the hospital and stuff? They, uh, they, yeah, they cut all that out just because it was like, yeah, it's, it's not necessary to the story, really. We, we already demonstrated that he's freaking out. And then here you have radio waves inside this machine um, that will uh, agitate the symbiote because sound agitates the symbiote. Um, and uh, and you can you kind of see that inf information. Uh, like you can kind of see that happens. Like so, some people are like, "Why did the, the the machine, like the MRI, like freak him out?" It's like, well, there's there's radio waves, um, in MRIs and, or CT scans. Yeah, um, Gemini. So Gemini, that's a, a, a not a reference to anything, but seeing the dog is a foreshadowing for something later. And then her name, um, she, I think she plays Mrs. Manfredi. At least that's what she's listed as in the IMDb too. But Mrs. Man Freddy, uh, her husband is Silvermane, which is a Spider-Man villain. So I remember when we found out Ellen Gerstein was going to play uh, that character, Mrs. Man Freddy, we all were theorizing, oh my God, is this set up for Silvermane? Are we going to get Silvermane somewhere in this universe? Um, but he's on death's bed, like her hus husband's on death's bed, so chances are we won't. But that was a nice little nod, again, for fans that are looking. But also another one of those things where Sony just, they have their writers, oh, just use that character, whatever, just use that character. Um... But here's, this is where they, they're they they're doing the radio wave. So again, another transition. So this way, if you didn't understand why the last machine was disrupting the symbiote, it's because it was releasing radio waves. Now you see that because it has the same effect on Mart Martin Batts Bradford. And a big shout out again to Martin Batts Bradford here and Ellen Gerstein for doing intros to our show as well. Um, so it was really great to get both of them, you know, to do intros. They're both awesome people. And then here, yeah, he's like right in front of his face. He's like, I couldn't even, could, I didn't see it coming. Like, Doris Skirth is actually the traitor. I think there was, a, I think there was more shot on this train too that they cut. Um, but I just love how expressive Tom Hardy is in this. <laughs> um, and just how abnormal he comes across to everybody else. He comes across funny to us, but this people are freaked out like that nobody's really enjoying this <laughs> um and then here again this is eddie craving tater tots uh it's so funny eddie's apartment here I, it's a one big room apartment with a bathroom off to the side that's exactly the kind of apartment i lived in 
when I first started, uh, or right before I started the Venom vlog, because I moved into my uh, in with my roommate, uh, Kevin. So I wasn't in, when I started the show, I don't think I was in my original apartment. Uh, but in that apartment, it looked very much like Eddie's, uh, except for the brick wall. But it was just one big square room and then a bathroom off to the side. Uh, no kitchen, but I had a refrigerator right in the middle of the, the living room like that. Uh, and then like a little table t with a with a, that little oven, little toaster oven. And I made tater tots all the time. Uh, and then I would lay down and meditate for my, 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 my migraines due to my aneurysms and stuff. I would lay on the floor a lot, uh, you know, to stretch my back out and to meditate. And, um, and so when I, and I wore pajama pants and like, when I watch this, I'm like, oh my God, it's so weird. It's, it's so weird. Like when I watch this movie the first time, Ralph bags, cause I shop at Ralph's. Um, I know there's not a Ralph's in San Francisco. Uh, not like that kind of Ralph's, but, uh, yeah, there was, it's so weird to me. I was like looking at Eddie's place and I'm like, it's like someone lived in my apartment while I was living there and then wrote the script to this movie because that's how it comes across. I was like, wow, I did all these little things that Eddie did, including making those tater tots on a toaster oven. Um, so uh, so it, it helped me when I was watching it. I kept going like, I, it was weird because I, I, it was like Truman Show weird where I was like, what am I I'm watching right now? Like I'm, <laughs> I'm watching a much better looking version of me doing all the things I do in my apartment. I go, this is, this is weird. And calling a place trying to get a job. I'm like, this is so crazy how similar it was. And it made me immediately identify with movie version of Eddie Brock um, on a level that, you know, I never would have in the comics. I was just like blown away by that, how eerily similar it was. I'm still not convinced that Ruben Fleischer or someone <laughs> did doesn't didn't like didn't you know live in an apartment like mine at one point in their life and when they hit their lows bought bags of tater tots and ate like that you know but yeah again that's the symbiote wasn't craving the tater tots eddie brock is so eddie brock is eating the tater tots not not um the suit and it's still not happy with him eating them but eddie needs sustenance too uh the 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 symbiote ate lobsters earlier so it's fine it, it's it's going to be fine for a few hours probably but here we have our big moment where Doris Girth has been exposed and and she's basically played up to um you know she's she's being led to her death now cuz he's like I want to know who did this and he's like being her friend he's being charismatic but then he he and then he just lets her die And it's weird this seems like a weird way to kill her too because we don't know that that suit would have uh, wouldn't have bonded with her, like like even Carlton Drake I don't think would have known that that because that suit could have bonded with her and have been a perfect match the way Eddie and his suit are. So that seems like a weird way to to kill her. I, I feel like you know I don't know I, I expected something a little different, maybe something more hands on with him if he's the bad guy. But I also didn't want her to die. I feel like she could have lived. Maybe she could have got out of that room, locked in the room until, hey, I'm going to come back and we'll figure out what to do with you. Uh, when my when Scott Hayes, when my team, Treese, gets back, we'll, we'll deal with you. And then maybe that gives her time to escape and then help Eddie later. I don't know. I would have probably gone that route because I really liked her character. Again, this is funny to us because we can hear the voice. We know what's happening. But these guys are, like, confused. They're like, what the F is going on? <laughs> and this whole scene was shot in Atlanta on set. This set, like I said, this apartment was in Atlanta. And they filmed the whole thing there. And the, the camera work for this was really great. And the way they choreographed all this um, to imagine the symbiote doing all these things um, while they were filming it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it should, if you get a chance to watch some of the behind-the-scenes stuff on this scene, it's it's really great. I think they put some of those videos up on YouTube. We might even have uh, made a video about it, I think, at one point. <laughs> I love that. That delivery of the word shit is so good. <laughs> and Big Fist. Oh, this is awesome. That's cool, too, like the way he slides in and turns. Um, but again, even when he's moving as Eddie, he's not moving. The suit is still part of him. <laughs> I remember that. I said, I said, because uh, he goes, why would we do that? In the trailer, 
we didn't hear the Venom side. And I said, wouldn't it be funny if the Venom side said, hey, let's eat everybody's heads. And then like a month later, we or two months later, we found out that's actually what the head says. And everyone was writing me going, dude, you guessed it, you guessed it. And I'm like, hey, that was a lucky guess, man. Uh, this scene was one of the first videos we saw. Uh, people recording from their apartment in Atlanta of him jumping out the window and, and being on a wire and falling down. That was one of the first videos we recorded from the behind the scenes stuff when they were filming this movie. So uh, it's fun to see the final product. It looks really good. So yeah, Carlton Drake here is kind of, he's happy with uh, the results. Like, oh my God, he's, he's achieved symbiosis. He achieved symbiosis, you know. Um, so now he wants them back alive because they, they did a live feed of the cameras they have, you know, when they were trying to detain him. And, uh, and now they're like, okay, um, he's, he's bonded with the thing. He's using it as a weapon. We need him back. This is cool. Kind of gives our first look at Venom, like what he's going to look like. <laughs> Parasite. <laughs> That's when I knew when I heard that word, I was like, all right, we've been trying to figure out cause people were like, Oh, what are you going to call your followers on this channel? And I was like, parasites. Like, like after hearing that line, I was like, that's the offensive word. I was like, uh, we got to use it. Cause I like taking like things like that and making it more fun, you know, endearing, like not, not be offended by it. So, so that's why we were like, all right, for people who follow this channel, parasites. Um, cause it's like, I, we mean it ironically, obviously. Um, and here's the big motorcycle chasing. So the reason this scene wasn't kind of chosen, I guess, to film and shoot and everything over the opening scene, uh, or no, 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 it wasn't. I don't think directly, but I mean, like when the opening scene, when they were like, we don't have the budget to do the astronauts landing on the meteor and doing all that stuff, but we can, you know, make this scene look more awesome and do a lot of more practical effects and CG effects in this. Um, they did a good job. Um, these close-up shots here are definitely shot on a stage in a room where um, the motorcycles put on like a, a device that, you know, twists and turns it and, and everything. And then they just have TV screens behind them with our green screens. Um, or even some of them, I think, had actual TV screens where they just showed footage of the explosion stuff and everything behind them and the cars going by. And I think some of this scene, I think some of this scene here was shot in Atlanta, uh, some of these buildings. And then where it ends, like when they like fall off and tumbles on the ground, I think that's all shot in Atlanta too. But this here, San Francisco, I believe, um, some of the other areas that we're going to see coming up with the hills are San Francisco. So they kind of shot it in both cities. And again, that's, that's a lot to keep track of. You know, movies aren't just this easy thing where you can just, you know, you have to, you have to think of things on the day while you're shooting it. Not just, you know, I know they always say like, Oh, you got it. We can fix it in post. It's like a ongoing joke. Well, fix it in post, but uh, nobody likes to fix it in post. It's, it's, that's a lot of hard work. You want to at least think about this stuff on the day. But I love this because this sets up the fire um, ability, like how fire hurts the suit. It sets that up a little bit more too, so you see him in actual pain there. I think they could have done it a little bit better, a little bit more clearer, but it still is a nice looking shot. And these little drones are kind of neat and they crash and there's like blue fire. It's like, yeah, it's something different, you know. We've seen chase scenes in a lot of movies, so it's, it's nice to see things done differently. That's kind of cool too. Reminds me of a Batman Returns, I think, when he had a make that sharp turn and like the grappling hook came out of the Batmobile and helped him turn. I think it was a Batman Returns. I can't remember. Um, maybe it was one of the cartoons. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, San Francisco here, this big jump that they did, this watching this behind the scenes stunt on this was awesome. It's a really cool stunt, scary stunt too. You gotta, um, there, a lot of it, there was stuff on wires for sure, but, uh, Someone did have to ramp up and jump down on some of these scenes and you know, it's it's gets scary a, 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 You could lose control of a motorcycle pretty easily. There was some of these shots here like this one here like coming up uh, We actually saw people filming from their apartments in these buildings up here right over here on the right uh, They filmed the cars coming up and crashing down going through this gate here um, and uh, There was people who shot that on their phones and we, we covered that in earlier episodes so again, fun seeing the final product. I love the making of movies. Um, probably more so than movies sometimes. <laughs> uh, I've worked on a lot of movie sets and uh, and TV show sets, and I, th that experience, that energy is always 
fun. Um, but it is fun to see the final product too. And in this case, the final product is, is a movie I enjoy watching. Um, and that's why I was like, all right, 350 episodes, we got to do this commentary track. We got to just, you know, rewatch this whole movie uh, from, from start to end and, and give you guys something you've been asking about for quite a while now. Because it's been, what, like nine months since the movie came out in theaters and about six months since it came out on Blu-ray. So, uh, so I, I have, sorry I took so long to get this done for you guys, but hopefully you're enjoying it. And hopefully you're letting me know throughout this movie. I mean, hopefully you're commenting down below um, as much as you want, telling me scenes that you liked, that you didn't like. Um, I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts. I like that too. That was pretty cool, actually. I'm not going to laugh. Boom! <laughs> but this here, again, you're going to see the symbiote demonstrating that power that it did at the beginning um, where it, it heals them. His lips are really wet in that scene. I can't help but notice, and I don't like it. <laughs> um, all right. Our big reveal. Look at this. Pancreas. So little, so little time. <laughs> I love it. Ugh. There. Now his face can be wet. <laughs> Oh, yes. Head chewed right off. <laughs> Why he didn't do that to Reese, or Treese, I don't know. Uh, he just threw Treese aside. I, I, he could have easily just grabbed Treese, bit his head off, and then threw him aside, and then leaned in and bit the other guy's head off. Uh, that would have worked for me, too. I love that shot where he jumps out of the water and in midair changes back into Eddie. Um, yeah. That's so crazy. Uh, that I that concept. I think about that. I mean, that's, I like that he said that out loud too, because it's. I feel like that's a very real reaction. Your my legs were just broken. I felt them broken, and now they're not. I can step and walk on them. Um, <laughs> fuel in the tank. Yeah. So at this moment, I think the symbiote is uh is basically um this or this moment is like you know it's inside it says it's inside said it um and it calls him a loser here and that's a setup for later because he's like I'm a loser too, uh, but it, it seems like at the moment here he's ready to complete the mission. Riot's gone. And, and Venom has a chance now to lead Eddie back to the rocket ship, bring the ship back to Clintar, and bring the Clintars back to Earth. He can succeed where Riot has failed because, according to Venom, Riot's gone somewhere where he doesn't know. So it looks like, you know, at this moment, Venom is choosing to complete the mission. But again, since that mission isn't so well established in the beginning, because uh, I feel like you sh they should have talked about it a little bit. Or they wait and save it for the end, which I, I get why, but still, like you want you want to know kind of what the motivation of these characters are. So that scene there, when he like makes that choice, I'm gonna you know uh, lead you to the rocket. That's him going. I'm gonna finish what Riot isn't gonna finish because Riot's gone. Um, but we don't really know that right now, kind of. But when he says fuel in the tank after he bites that dude's head off again, he ate lobster earlier. Eddie ate tater tots during the day, so the suit was hungry, and it was like, look, I need to eat something. Um, so it ate that dude's head off so it could get that chemical so that it could be recharged. So here we already have the yellow symbiote is dead and now the blue symbiote is dead because after it couldn't bond properly to these hosts when it left those hosts it was malnourished it was you know everything so they you know it basically, basically they kind of starved to death so it's that's interesting that they had a weak they had that weakness where they can starve to death they can die um so it it, it plays up that 
that need though where the suit's like i'm not i can't let you go eddie because if i do i could wither away um so it's 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 neat you got to set those kind of those boundaries and those rules up um but uh one of the things we talked about when he said i'm in your head eddie i wish they would have showed that more um in this movie like i wish they would have done more with that because in the comics when eddie brock when the suit leaves peter and goes to eddie it puts Peter's memories inside Eddie. It's able to take memories with it, which is really neat. Cause like as someone who's you know gone through memory loss and things like this, there's a no one really knows where memories come from, not really. And so the idea of this alien life form being able to take that with them, like like the memories are still in Peter Parker, but when the suit left him, it also had Peter's memories. It like a, it like bonded with his memories too, which is it's such a cool concept and so that's how eddie instantly in the comics knew spider-man was peter parker he knew instantly uh so in the in the spider-man 3 movie they just had it to where he saw peter get you know pull off the spider-man suit but in the comics the memories went into eddie brock i wish they did that in this movie i wish when the the memories left melora walter's character they went into eddie and eddie like at least for a little bit here gets gets flashes of her life her life being maybe she was like a mom and then she became homeless and her you know her kid stopped talking to her or something like you know they could have added some kind of tragedy there something like with some heart to it um and that could have been something the symbiote sympathize with um and and then symp and eddie sympathize with and they have a shared sympathy over it you know as a bonding moment i mean i feel like they could have done something with that ability um and i don't know I hope, hopefully they do in the second one. I hope we see something like that in the second one. Like with Carnage or something. Maybe when Carnage kills people, he he like puts the suit on them. And then as the suit comes off, it like, you know, kills the person. But it, it takes their memories or two. And so Carnage literally like kills the people and then takes their memory. I don't know. I'm, I'm Maybe I'm just reaching too far there. with I, I like spitballing ideas, but they're not always good ideas. Um, <laughs> I love that too. Um, this is all this is kind of funny because uh, speaking of sony resident evil did this too they did a thing where someone wrote a, uh, a note and you know everything and kind of had like a similar shot like this uh but i i do like this eddie's like all right here's the evidence i recorded stuff at the life foundation um and I like that he wasn't willing to put his friend's career at, at line. <laughs> uh, you got to love that line. Um, his friend, who was like the, the doorman at the bottom, even though Eddie didn't really care too much about the rules at the beginning of the movie, when he talked to the guy about his motorcycle being parked, he still cares about the guy. And he's like, look, I don't want anything to happen to this guy. I don't want you to eat him. So we're going to you know, go the other way. And then again, when you saw the plane going overhead, it, the sound disrupts Eddie. But I feel like at that point it was kind of useless to do that. Um, I think they just wanted a quick scare moment of like, oh, what's going to happen to him? But uh, they already I don't like when things are established too many times, especially when you're going to bring it back at the end with like the rocket ship and the sound. It's like, ah, eh, that's the sound thing's already been established twice. We don't need it, you know, drilled into our heads. Um, but this scene's great. This is probably the my favorite action scene in the movie. Um, when the trailer first showed this, it was played more horror. I think in this movie, in this scene, the final product, it comes across more action oriented, but I would have loved a straight up horror version of this, like where it's just like full horror. I mean, right there, those shots look horror related and I feel like it was probably shot that way, but then in editing and then adding in the music and, and the Wilhelm scream, we're going to get up coming up here. It just comes across not as serious and not as scary. And that's kind of a shame, but, uh, these moments are great. I know everything goes by really quick, but I think it's effective for the scene because it's like mist and and like these trained guards and i think it's more effective this way i don't know i like it i love and i love that the silhouette effect of like the suit yeah i mean that's really well done i think scenes like this is where ruben fleischer kind of shines as a director um is kind of the movement of this scene I don't know. I dig it. I dig it a lot. But also, he's really effective as, like, comedy. Like, uh, Woody Harrelson in Zombieland had really good body comedy, you know? Like, where his body language was kind of comedic. And 
Tom Hardy has that a lot in this movie, too. And I'm so excited that Ruben Fleischer's doing Zombieland 2. I think that means he might not be back for Venom 2. I don't know. I've heard rumors. I think Atlanta Filming said they're going to possibly... He heard from a crew member that it works on a lot of movies in Atlanta that they're scheduling Venom 2, possibly, for for November release. He also said never use him as a source because he just hears things from crew members and he's not, he doesn't consider himself a new source. Uh, but you know, I, I still, if he heard that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't doubt it that he heard that. So November seems late enough to where Ruben could come back. And after he made $850 million off this hundred dollar budget movie, like I think this movie, it costs a hundred million to make. And I think another hundred million to market it. So it's $200 million. And it made $850 million at the box office, so that's uh, $650 million. And it gets to keep, you know, from the theaters to them, I would say they probably get to keep half or like 60% of all that money. Um, so this movie made, you know, $400 million profit at, at the very least, um, $350 to $400 million profit for the studio. That's a lot of freaking money. That funds your next two Venom movies with marketing just right there, just on that. Or it funds Morbius and Venom as your next two movies. Um, so that's why it's so important. Like when people go, oh, the movie the movie made money. It wasn't a flop or, you know, or it broke even. That's that's still good. It's not. Nobody's in the business to make a little bit of money or break even. Uh, everybody wants to fund their next few movies. They want to make a franchise. And Venom is definitely a franchise starter. Uh, it made a ton of money for Sony. A ton. I like the scene here, too, where she she understands now. She sees that there's something in Eddie, and it's talking to him. Yeah. I, I really like this scene. And Eddie's saying, like, I don't... Because you want to know, like, what's it feel like to have an alien symbiote on you? These scenes answer that. He says, I feel nothing. I'm just hungry. That he apathy, like he is, his emotions are, are fried. But he feels hungry and sad. He's sad when he's around her. Pretty honest response. <laughs> Pretty honest response too. Like, uh, now's not time. Uh, cause not only, not only is it around at the right time here in the moment, but also like in her life, she's like careers, you know, moving up again. She's got a, a different guy in her life. And then here you get a little, the, the drone coming in after them. So, you know, showing like, okay, they're not truly free from the life foundations, you know, thumb, you know, they're still under the, uh, Carlton Drake's thumb. But this scene here, like this is another one, this, there's an extended take of this scene. It's not on the DVD or Blu-ray or anything, which is a shame, but this scene went on a lot longer. Uh, the little girl comes in right here and it's riot and again we we i think we've seen like through some of information news information where like riot in a host saw life foundation is making a rocket and blah 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 and everything so it's like all right i gotta get back to i gotta get back to the life foundation originally the little girl she lifts him up in the air like so that pillar behind him he gets lifted up like 10 feet in the air and being choked and she like kind of like lifts him up there's a lot more going on in that scene that they cut for time, and I feel like probably not good cutting in that in that regard. Because one, you want to know, I mean, I don't know, it 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 was such a waste of riot to just have him globe trotting this whole movie, and primarily in one host. So him now and the little girl, and like come and coming here, it's like you're like, how did the little girl get in without killing others? Did it kill others? Like, you, I don't know, you just. Some some things you don't. You, it's one of those moments. Like I heard this a lot in screenwriting, where they go and movie making, where they go, look, either the audience is going to get it or they won't get it. You don't need to show every beat of how a character gets into a room or everything. That's true, uh, but um, you also you you also want to be clear with information too. And I feel like they could have been more clear with how that girl ended up there. And I think they could have done more with Riot. Like I said, if it was Scream, Scream would have been much cooler. Um, I think to. Uh, to to use because they could add scream over in asia or indonesia or wherever it was where it crash landed and it's jumping host to host and maybe carlton drake sends it sends treese and a team over to capture her and they're able to capture scream and bring scream back um and then carlton drake's like look you're the last 
the last host. You're the last symbiote uh, because I, I can't get a hold of Eddie Brock. So I have you now. So uh, so there's this other symbiote we can destroy. And then Riot's like Venom, you know, or Scream is like Venom. Like so to me, there's like different ways you could have constructed the story while still telling the same story. And having Riot just be this thing that like moves around in the background for an hour and a half of the movie and then reveals itself near the end now, you're just kind of like, Eh, it's it doesn't make the care doesn't make riot a character riot doesn't come across as a character with a real goal uh they try to try to cram that into his exposition near the end but it's it's not really well executed so riot and carlton drake from here on in the movie become really weak for villains for me uh, i really just stopped caring about both of them um because at this point i'm like why would i even care about riot i don't even know who he is i only knew his name was riot because we followed the movie being made um but i can imagine a an audience member watching this being like, what? <laughs> what? Like someone who didn't know what was happening in the movie before it came out. But here you have Gemini, Gemini and Mrs. Manfredi and Mr. Manfredi. And again, the, the foreshadowing earlier, and now it's part of the dog and bonded with the dog, which is cool because we've seen that happen in the comics numerous times. I like that shot where the dog's just revealed sitting there, staring at Eddie. Why she's dressed like this, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> she's, uh, you know, not saying like a professional woman can't have like a night out where she's, you know, dresses in a skirt and stuff. But I'm just curious. i just curious what the, the logic was. Because she looks great in it, but I, it's also distracting. It takes me out of the character a little bit. And yet to know that this whole time Riot and Carlton Drake were perfect matches, it's like, I don't know. There's convenience in storytelling and then there's, <laughs> there's they, they just should have explained better what the what you needed to be compatible. So like Venom, maybe it finds Eddie compatible because they're both losers. They kind of set that up. But uh, Carlton Drake, it should have been Rage. Like Riot is mad and Carlton Drake is mad. I can, I can assume that's the reason why they are compatible but the movie doesn't do a good job of conveying that or doesn't say that hmm. This, this whole scene, I, I like the scene overall, but again, Carlton Drake and like he's 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 having too much fun with it, and I feel at this point he should be out of patience. Like he should he should have came in hot like that. Yeah. I mean this the shot's great. It's and the transformation's really great. Um, yeah, so anyway, <laughs> this is getting, like I said, this is getting to the part of the movie where I'm like, oh, this was all building to this, and I'm just glad this scene is here. So this is, here's where we start to get the plot, actually, or at least the plan from Riot. But Riot looks so similar to Venom that I just, I don't know, I don't know why making this movie they didn't think about that, like a, a, a dark gray and a black symbiote again like I, it just to me would have made more sense to do someone like bright and colorful like scream or even do lasher where lasher's green um because i know they they probably avoided scream because the next movie's gonna have carnage and he's red but i don't know scream would have been cool sin eater would have been cool too i would have liked to see sin eater <laughs> and there's back to classic eddie taking a stand and failing Hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, oh, now his head gets bitten off. <laughs> and here we go, she venom. Like this freaked me out when I watched this in the theater. Um, this is the free comic that you got if you saw the movie. Um, it it revealed this. So they said, don't read the comic before you watch the movie, which I'm glad I didn't because. You know, it gave away, it, it spoiled She-Venom. So a lot of people were speculating if she's going to become Venom. They even asked Michelle, and she said, well, I didn't do motion capture, so probably not. But, as we found out later, they didn't do motion capture for this movie. They did a different technique to uh, add the CG on. So uh, so she was right. She she answered correctly. She said, she said I didn't do mocap. And everyone just assumed that was the only way you could do it. So that was cool. That was a great way to keep the secret, by also but also telling the truth. That kiss there is up for best kiss on the MTV Movie Awards. Uh, make sure you vote for it. I don't think we have a lot of time left, depending on how I, when I upload this. I don't know if we'll have any time left, uh, but hopefully we do. So go to the MTV website and vote. Um, you can vote every day. Every 24 hours you can vote. But uh, they said something like, uh, she says like, uh, later on, like, oh, you kissed me. And he goes, she goes, yeah, that was your buddy's idea. I think she was just saying that. Like, I don't, I think she was, because she kind of says it with a smirk. I think she's just saying that to be like, to not admit she still has feelings for him on that level. Because um, I'm, gu I'm guessing that's going to be something they explore in the next movie is them getting back together. Uh, but yeah, so when she says it, she's like, it was your buddy's idea. I, it was Anne's idea. I think, I think the suit inside Anne, it, it, it's in her head. It knows how she really feels just like it does with Eddie. So it, it knows that deep down she's burying that she still loves Eddie tremendously. So when they kiss, it's like it is definitely Anne and Eddie kissing. The suit is physically there between them when their lips touch, for sure. No arguing that. But it is an Eddie Brock and Anne Wayne kiss. There's just a third being there with them. Uh, but it's up for best kiss, so I say vote for it because I would love to see this movie win for best kiss. I think that'd be awesome because Spider-Man 1, I think, won for best kiss for the upside down kiss. So this would be awesome to do for this one. Um, but here we go. This is our. This should be our scene. Like we had Carlton Drake in the last scene talk to Riot and learn more about their relationship and their story and their plot. Now we're supposed to get that here with Eddie. We get a little bit of it. Um, but then you have the reveal here where the suit says, "I was going to complete the mission. I was going to lead an army of symbiotes here. But now that Riot's back and he's going to do it." And I spent time with you and, and spent time with Anne, and I understand these emotions and these this what the Earth can be and what goodness the, the Earth offers. Something in me doesn't want to destroy it. And he goes, and, and that has a lot to do with you, Eddie. So I like that. I mean, that's, to me, that's some good character development. It's not great, um, but at least it, it, if, you, if you're sitting there wondering, why this, why this, at least it answers some of those. Look at this. Boom! I can't remember that guy's name, but we talked about him on the sh on the show before, um, and we've talked about the amazing team that done the visuals for this movie and and the, the people that worked on this movie. And it was funny because I actually I actually um, got an email from someone who worked on this movie, and they said they didn't like my video of them because I spoke too positively about it. like I gave them too much credit for the work they did, which wasn't my intention. I mean, as you guys know, I talk. Everyone I did an episode on, whether they did, like, the teeth, like, you know, the dentures for some of the characters, or they did, like, you know, the costuming or whatever. Like, we talked about so many people that worked on this movie. That's what this show is. It's like a, an ongoing love letter for the character and the movie and the comics and the cartoons and the games. It's an ongoing love letter, and we, we pay respect to everybody. And I put everyone on a pedestal. I think everyone who works on these things did amazing work. And so I like to talk about them individually if I can. But this one individual was like, he wrote me an email and said, you got to take it down or, you know, or else. And I was just like, uh, okay. I was like, I mean, if anyone's bothered that much about one of my videos, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll take it down, dude. I mean, if it bothers you that bad, I'm sorry. And if I got information wrong, I'm also sorry. That wasn't my intention. Um, but when I make these videos, people don't understand, like, a lot of this I go off my me my memory, typically when I make YouTube videos on Venom. Like, I'll read the comic and then I let it sit in my head for a couple days and then I... And then I review it how I remember it. And the reason I do that is because this show is also about me. I mean, when we started the show, I was like, you know, trying to lose weight uh, while doing the show. I was cooking. I was doing all these things. Um, and, you know, being an aneurysm survivor, I'm, I'm trying to keep my memory sharp and clear. 
this show provides all that for me. So the show is, so it's, yeah, of course I get things wrong sometimes or, or say the wrong thing, you know, about someone uh, sometimes, it, but I try to correct myself it, it, either in the comments or I make another video saying, Hey, I got that wrong. And here, you know, so here's the, you know, here's what I got wrong. And I'm sorry about that. I mean, shoot, it happens to non aneurysm people. They make mistakes, uh, aneurysm, non aneurysm survivors. So, so to me, when I, I put a lot of work into these shows, even the ones where I'm just sitting here talking, I, I have to, my, my mind has to be working at full power and that's not always easy for me. Um, so, you know, sometimes I get it, get things wrong. So, but this guy really did not like that. So I said, Hey man, all right, whatever. I'll, I'll take the video down. Uh, but I like to think that I at least talk about everyone highly, like, like I did that guy. And I wasn't just super positive about him. I also made other videos about other people that worked on visual effects and I was just as positive. Um, so, you know, so it bummed me out that that guy was so bent out of shape about it, but you know, whatever, different perspectives. So I get it. And he sees things on his side that I don't. So I let it go. I was like, whatever, I'll just, I'll be the bigger person and take the video down. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but that shot we saw earlier there, switching gears back to the movie, when uh, Riot rips Venom and Eddie apart, that's a nod to the Carnage Unleashed, uh, you know, cover, where, where Carnage rips Venom and Eddie apart. But here, this is an interesting concept where Riot absorbed Venom and now became like an uber Venom. Um, but then again, we have the sound coming off and it's separating them. And, and that's coming from Anne, who's watching all this on the monitors. Um, and she knows sound hurts because they set that up earlier with the uh, the the CT scan or whatever. Um, so yeah. So that so, so again, things that are set up are paid off in this movie. They do they do the best they can, and some of it comes across really well. I really like this shot. This set is really cool too, because um, I think only that platform they're on and the ramp that's all that's there on set, and the rest is CG. Um, I like that he'd even give him a chance to do his his uh his villain speech. He's like, nah, screw you. But it doesn't matter because dang. And see now Riot really does look different than Venom, except the color. Like the color is like oh, he I know he's gray, but it's like it's too close to black. But him with the spikes and the things like that, it's like, well, I'm glad they, they did something like that you know, to make them bigger and he can create blades the way carnage can. So like someone will be like, Hey, why isn't that a piece of the symbiote and it bonding with Eddie? That's no longer a symbiote. The, the symbiote can produce these blades made out of its skin and use them almost like shooting a fingernail out. Um, but there's like no DNA or symbiote DNA on it. So, um, so I like that, uh, that they kind of, kind of has a carnage power there, but hopefully that doesn't take away from carnage in the next movie, but that should have killed Eddie, but he was hanging on by a, a, a glimmer of light. And, uh, and then right there, that little white spark, the interior of the symbiote being like pure white light. I like that too. Cause that kind of is a, it almost makes like a symbol on his chest, which is cool. But then I like how Eddie's like, and Venom, <laughs> they use that line to get back at him, but then they also use his skin that he used to tear the ship apart. Uh, because they knew it could cut through the metal and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. So, he literally, he kills Eddie with the weapon that then kills him. Um, so, that's I kind of like that a lot. This shot's good. I like the, the fire and it's burning the suit. And, um, and it burns away. You think it's gone, man. It says goodbye. So, you're like, no. Nah. Yeah, and it made a yeah it made a parachute, but then it caught on fire, like it started burning. So, yeah. So you're you're you know it's they did a pretty good job of selling you on know, like oh maybe the symbiote's gone now, maybe it's it's dead and and Eddie's all by himself. You know where is it gonna go from here? Because remember at this point we were all hoping for a sequel. We were hoping Carnage would get teased, but we didn't know for sure. You know we 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 heard rumors. We heard Woody was gonna maybe be Cletus, and we heard all these rumors and stuff, but nothing was a hundred percent. So it was so at this point in the movie, I even I was kind of like, oh my goodness, uh, they made a one and done movie like for real. But uh, but of course not, yeah, of course not. They they you know someone at Sony believed in this movie enough, and uh, but I think still even this movie super exceeded expectations, big time, big time. Even to me, I I would hope 
I you know like I never would have thought a Venom movie would make eight hundred fifty million dollars near a bi nearing a billion like so hopefully the second one's good people like Carnage hopefully it does make a billion the second one that'd be amazing I would love that so much I would love this franchise to keep going at least three movies at least and the third one can be you know versus Spider Man or whatever but if they do it but here we go. You can see here, like, their chemistry. I, I think there is chemistry here between them. I think these two actors did a great job. Um, and uh, and this is, besides that opening scene, this is the closest we really get to see them as, like, a relationship. And you can see that it's not that different from the opening scene, so I kind of like that. You can see her... Yeah, that's that scene where she's like looking off like yeah, that was your buddy's idea. That was kind of good. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh I like that. That watch there, by the way, I don't know if that's the watch, because remember we did an episode where there's like this really nice watch uh, making company made a Venom movie watch that I could never afford because it was like $2,000 or $5,000 or something. Um, I think that's the watch. I can get a quick blip of it. Uh, rest in peace, Stan. I love that. I love how meta that is. He's like, don't give up on her, either of you. So, he's, so cl clearly Stan's talking to him uh, and the symbiote. Uh, but that's kind of what Stanley does when he appears in these movies. It is usually on a meta level. I think there's a one of these signs for one of these restaurants in this area. I think it's called Ron Lim, Ron Lim's restaurant or something like that. Ron Lim is the artist that uh, with Mark Bagley that worked on Lethal Protectors. Um, I think he drew the last three issues or something like that. Um, so he's been he's done a lot of symbiote work in comics, and uh, so I think they they put. They did a reference of his name on one of these streets. <laughs> I like I like this how he's trying to tell he's trying to tell the suit like, hey, you can't eat people, and I'll I'll, I'll be okay with it, but you got to eat the right people, meaning the wrong people. And he's like, well, how do we know who that is? And so, boom, come right back to his little shop here. Uh, where they make little chit chat, but I I like this because it's like all right. <laughs> so now the suit is like okay, tater tots for you, chocolate for me. Uh, again, the suit I would say argue is not craving the tater tots, it just knows Eddie is. <laughs> but yeah, here we go. So this is the suit going like all right. Now, well, tell us who the bad guy is. That guy, boom. And I love how he walks up. He's like, boom, like all tough looking. <laughs> you eat your face you'll be a turd in the wind <laughs> people ragged on this movie for that that uh dialogue so much but you know what every time someone referenced that even if they were making fun of the movie it's it spread the word of the movie man <laughs> you 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 did free marketing for sony by slamming on that line of dialogue <laughs> so it's kind of fun to watch all these people rip it apart, and then I was just like, "Ah, it's not a great line for sure, but it's a uh, it's a very venom thing to say, though." <laughs> I like how he threatens that he's gonna do all these bad things to the guy, and then just kills him. <laughs> <laughs> See, there it is, Ron Lim's herbal something. It's over there on the right. Here we go. Copyright. Copyright strike, Venom, 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 Venom. Not a big fan of this song at all. Um, but uh, when I posted my reaction to it, I think I played like 30 seconds of the song, but not like a straight 30 seconds. It was like 10 seconds and then a cut to like 12 more seconds later on in the song and then a cut to the end of the song. And when I um, 
post it on YouTube. I, I didn't just get a copyright thing. Like, like Eminem's group, like, hit me hard. Like, they, they added a strike to my channel. It was like, I was like, whoa, what the F? But then I actually deleted it. I was like, look, I'll delete the video. I tweeted at Eminem and stuff. And I was like, look, I'll delete the video. And, uh, and I'll just post a version without the song. Because the way I edited it, I had headphones on. So I, it was easy to just go back and re-edit it without the oh Matthew Libatique doing the, the cinematography awesome great talented dude um I went in and took the audio out it was really easy to do because luckily I still had the the template up on my on my uh editing software so I was like wow this is easy I can just take it out and re-upload it without the music playing so I did that and and wrote uh, and a shout out to Ludwig Gordonson who I think won an Academy Award for his music on Black Panther I think so uh, awesome. And I got his soundtrack for Venom. My mom actually, for my birthday, got me a, a record player back here, as you can see. But she got me the soundtrack on vinyl as well, the Venom soundtrack. Um, and it's awesome. So awesome. It's not the soundtrack like with the, it's the score, not the soundtrack. Um, but yeah. So uh, anyway, so that, all that aside. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, overall, though, I, I love this movie. But the Eminem thing, he they withdrew their strike against me so like all right you, you cut the music out and you upload a new video and i think i could have probably left the original video up and they would have just taken the money that that video made which trust me i don't make hardly any money on youtube um i have to get like thousands of views to even make like a dollar if that so uh so and I, most of my videos are always under a couple hundred views um so i you know, it wasn't like so i think they were just like you know what just take the strike off like he's just the kid's just excited for your uh for your you know soundtrack and it was like i, I listen to the song and i'm like it's not a the the verses aren't bad but the chorus i'm not a big the, the venom, venom, venom. i'm just like ah i'm not a big fan of that it just feels very uncreative to me but the rest of the song is pretty good actually like the knock knock let the devil in thing um but yeah so no eminem took the strike off my channel which was super nice of them they, they didn't have to do that because they, they said the strike is going to remain even if you delete the video and i'm like well just in good faith i'm still going to delete the video and I think someone was like, all right, fine. He deleted the video. It's cool. So they took the strike away, which was really nice of them. Um, and I have nothing but respect for Eminem. He's got that album he made with the Venom song on it. It's an amazing album. Um, but just the chorus. I'm just, you know, I got some thoughts on the chorus, but the rest of the song is fine. And then here we go. Of course, like typical Sony, they put this in the trailer. Uh, and of course, it's the bonus scene of the movie. And of course, most of us guessed that it was going to be him going to talk to Cletus Cassidy. So... And yeah, we found out that Cletus Cassidy has had a lifetime, and that's why I don't mind his age, and uh, that it's Woody uh, Harrelson because Woody's a great actor. I, I do agree that the the um, the wig is a little too much. I would have personally probably had it to where he was pulling his hair out in this scene, so that way he could look. The wig could be half there, and you see bald spots of blood, and his fingernails are bleeding because he's digging into his scalp. Um, I thought that would have been better, and if he he could even said like. Like, what are you doing? And he's just like, you know, um, you know, they won't give me scissors to cut my hair, Eddie. So I wanted to look my best when you came and, you know, and, and, or whatever. So, um, and then in the next movie, you could have had him be bald Woody Harrelson because the wig doesn't look great. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. There is an extended version of the scene too. If you watch the, the DVD or Blu-ray, um, I think we even did an episode on the deleted scenes as well. Um, and they have more dialogue here, more things. You see more set up there before Eddie steps into the light. But I still would have liked to hear the symbiote in this scene. And then him, like the whole point of him bringing Eddie there was to say, hey, I'm going to tell you where these bodies that weren't found. Because he killed so many people that they weren't even all found by, you know, the government and stuff uh, and, the, and the authorities. So, um... So he's like, oh, I know, I know more. Like I know more than uh, you know, more bodies out there. So I'll give you the exclusive since you covered this, you know, uh, the alien thing, and you've and you've you've made a career of yourself exposing stuff. I'm interested in you, Eddie, and and this bounce back you have. I'm kind of curious. You fell and and built yourself back up. So I'm I'm kind of curious to see how you did that. And uh, and here I'm actually going to stop the movie because we're in the credits now. Um, we just passed all the you know Stanley title card and stuff like of him. Uh, stunt coordinator Chris O'Hara. He also played uh, John Jameson. Um, but yeah, so all these amazing people. Normally I would stay through the credits and I would advise you to stay through the credits, but just for audio purposes, 
I'm going to stop the movie here because the, the music is a really good song, but it's like really loud in my ears and it's hard for me to, you know, to talk to you guys directly. So I'm gonna take my headphones off so I can just wrap this up and say thank you. 350 episodes, all the support, everything you've done. Uh, hopefully you've liked this. Uh, you know, hopefully you didn't mind because obviously I can't show the movie during this. It was just me talking, but hopefully that worked for you guys. If you watch this with your, you know, your viewing of the movie, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm um, sorry for that one cut in the middle there. I had to do it because my phone was only going to record for like an hour and then it was going to cut it off so I had to you know start up another episode um, but yeah I mean the movie overall like I said I still give it a 7 out of 10 a lot of great stuff in it um, there's some things that I don't agree with that the movie did uh, even things re-watching it that I uh, hopefully I illuminated some things that maybe you might not have got or understood hopefully I shine some light on that uh, or if there was things I missed that you think I should have talked about you know obviously that's what the comment section is for down below you can let me know down there what you thought of this movie and uh, and if there was a, a thing that I overlooked I would love to hear it down below so we can keep talking um, I do hear a lot of noise outside so hopefully a lot of that wasn't here when we were recording this uh, but I, I have no choice I mean this was the only time during this whole week that I could record it and I want to keep these episodes coming up and keep, and keep them coming out uh, and this is going to be a long episode as is like a two-hour episode so I had to just go through because like people moved out of an apartment near me and they're cleaning it out and it's just loud as hell. And I was like, unless I wanted to wait till next week when my roommate lives, leaves town, I could have recorded this then. But I, I don't want to get that behind on Venom Vlog episodes. So hopefully that wasn't a big deal to you guys. And hopefully you stayed through and saw all the, you know, the, the I guess the digital codes I gave out through all these episodes. Um, I appreciate that. We gave out 31 digital codes in this episode today. So I thank you for not only watching this whole video, but also, you know, uh, supporting this channel as long as you have. If you're new here or if you're not new here, either way, I appreciate you being here at all. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts again about the movie down below. And if you made your own commentary or if you know someone else that did something like this, let me know down in the comments below because I'd love to go check it out and, and see what other people think of this movie too, especially if they did a commentary track. I'd love to hear it. Uh, but for now, that's it. I'm signing off here. I appreciate everything. Again, as always, what you guys did. Happy 31st birthday, Venom. I'm glad I could do something like this for your birthday and do a long episode and, and a long commentary on your movie. It was fun re-watching this movie. I haven't seen it. I watched it, I think, once when it came out on Blu-ray and then one more time, like a, like maybe like at the beginning of this year in January. So it was fun. It was like been five months since I've seen the movie and it was great to re-watch it and comment on everything. And hopefully I said some things that you guys found interesting. So thank you so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Make sure you go buy this movie you know it's on sale now i think it's coming up on stars they're going to put on stars if you're a stars member um i, I think maybe netflix might have it at some point or maybe does uh, but it's out there buy it watch it whatever you can watch it legally you know i'm not a big fan of pirated movies or pirated tv shows uh, a lot of people all these people in the credits worked very hard on this movie and I, you know, that hard work should be rewarded on some level. And so I would say this movie, if you haven't seen it, is worth a watch. Uh, and But most likely, if you're watching my commentary, you have seen the movie. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are down below. Thanks again for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.